So this is lecture two on the topic of greed. Um, it is, as you know, with all of these lectures, it's always an opportunity for us to take the abstract sin uh, and to dive into a more concrete situation, the situation of the development of medieval social political life. Um, usually we find a connection. Sometimes it's tenuous. Last week, of course, we had uh, sloth, Acadia, depression, and we looked at liberal arts, uh, education in the Middle Ages. Um, we focus on the 12th and 13th centuries. This week, we're going to take on the, the big one in terms of historiography. Is this the origins of capitalism? Do ca does capitalism begin uh, in places like Italy and like Belgium uh, in the 13th century or not? Or is that a ridiculous statement? So we're going to look at four things. Um, we're going to look at simony first, a grounding, and of course the wheel of fortune that goes with it. Um, we're going to look at capital, the big question. Uh, will be, is this the era in which we see the origins of capitalism? Uh, then we will look, for the most substantial part of the, pay, of the talk will be, uh, for me at least, on poverty, the most intellectually substantial. So if, you, if you're going to get off the bus and come back on the bus at any moment, when you see the green sign with poverty, then I would, that's the time to get back on the bus. Uh, and finally, uh, discovery. There is also a bonus round, uh, but I'll leave that as a surprise. And as I say, the meta discourse this week is is this discourse about capitalism itself. Historians vary on this. I mean, what is capitalism anyway, is, is one question. It's obviously not a word that Marx uses. Um, it's a word of convenience. It's a way of conceptualizing, obviously, a mode of economic life, um, a mode for organizing more than economics, society itself. I'm not really going to offer you a definition. I am, however, going to look at something practices that we would consider to be capitalist emerging uh, in the 12th and 13th centuries, particularly the 13th century. Things like a money economy, uh, which is more abstract than other forms of economic exchange. Uh, banking is, is going to be important too. The views on this vary. On the one end of the spectrum, you have someone like Jacques Le Goff, who argues, yes, it, this is pre-capitalist. A pre-capitalist society emerges in the 13th century. Um, and on the other hand, you have people who like... Um, like uh, Bruce Campbell, who say, no, it's not capitalism. It's just, you know, it's, it's because profit is not essential. You can be the judges, okay? You be the judges. Let's start with simony, though. Uh, let's start with some, some more horror, if you like. Um, I did briefly mention some of the more horrific uh, associations with, with avarice and greed uh, in the last lecture. We did talk about usury. We did talk about some of Dante's Inferno and its punishments. Let's just mention simony very briefly. Um, I'm going to begin with sort of a counter case study. So what is simony, guys? It, it derives from Simon Magus, who you remember. I know you remember you Zoomers. Um, Simon Magus, of course, is an archetype of hubris and pride. He is the, the um, rival of St. Peter in Rome, uh, who pretends to be more powerful than St. Peter, like he can do all these magic tricks. But, so he, he, he is also an avatar of pride, but Simon also gives his name to this sin, which is essentially bribery. It's essentially paying for something that you're not entitled to through illicit means. So Simon is accused of doing this. He's accused of paying, bribing people to get his high status. Um, in a practical terms, we're talking about people paying so they can become bishops or priests. And this is seen as like the lowest of the low. Uh, to put it in context, in Dante's Inferno, um, theft of church property, which is what simony technically is, it's the worst punishment. I think it's the worst, but Giacomo's not here. I think it's the worst punishment in the whole lot of Inferno. I mean, right at the bottom of hell, we do have um, Count Ugolino, uh, who was left to starve to death and then ate his own children. Uh, oh, horrible, horrible story. But the, the retribution for that is Ugolino eating the skull of the man who locked him in that prison. That's pretty bad. That's pretty bad. But at least Ugolino's getting something out of it. Um, I think, actually... Uh, Vanifucci, the, Simon, the Simoniac, I think it's the worst punishment. The punishment is quite simple and it's quite terrible. It's being chased by snakes. They, they wrap themselves around him and then he burns to death in ashes and then resurrects again to have it all happen over and over for, for, for eternity. This is the punishment because it's theft of church property. It's worse than your usual theft. Okay, simony is the lowest of the low. It's, it's fraud and deceit, but it also involves frauding and deceiving, deceiving the highest good, the highest good, which is, of course, the church. 
Okay, so here is a man accused of simony. Um, here is a hero, uh, Peter Metzabarber. Uh, Igneo is his nickname because he was accused of simony. Um, these debates really hot up around about the late 11th century. Accusations of simony. You're a simoniac, you know, I'll try and take you down. Uh, you shouldn't be a priest. There's this, like, there's this movement that gets empowered where people try to take down high, people of high status and accuse them of simoniac, being simoniac. Um, Peter Metzabarba is one of them. He's a Florentine hero because he's accused of simony. He says, I'm not guilty. I did not bribe my way into this office. I'm legit and you can, I can prove it by walking on fire. He does walk on fire, and as you can see, the image doesn't lie. Um, Metababa is, is, uh, is unharmed. The accusation has, has like, a, like water of a duck's back, the fire has gone off him uh, because he's innocent. So he's a hero, um, although you see how serious, look, look at how theatrical this accusation is. Look how serious this accusation is. Um, the Wheel of Fortune, you know, Within this whole simony debate is how, who deserves to get high status? Who deserves the, the benefits of becoming a great priest or a bishop? Uh, and who deserves none of that? Who deserves, you know, the heart of all this is should people know their place? Should there be social mobility? Um, a lot of these anxieties about simony are also sort of this jealous discourse. He didn't deserve it. He must have paid his way. Um, the Wheel of Fortune is a fascinating uh, metaphor image. I'm sure you're familiar with it. The, the essence of the Wheel of Fortune is this kind of pessimistic one of, well, whoever's at the top will soon be at the bottom again. The, the wheel will turn. Whoever's a king now will eventually be on the bottom, and whoever's on the bottom will come back to the top. Um, which is interesting because it doesn't actually ha work that way. <laughs> Peasants don't become kings. Kings don't really fall down to rags. Uh, there are one or two occasions where that does happen. But it's an interesting metaphor of why bother? Why bother trying to climb the wheel? You'll only be crushed by it. Um, there's a good gospel which satirizes simony quite well. Um, and you see a lot of this accusation against uh, popes and things like that. Um, this is the gospel according to, the Mark of, to Mark of Silver, which is, you know, joke, Mark of Silver. You know. uh, gospel according to money, if you like. Um, and it's about uh, a man who goes to the church and he's genuinely poor. He has nothing. And he says, please let me in. I have nothing. I need to be fed. And they say, friends, you and your poverty can go to hell. Get behind me, Satan, because you do not smell of money. Amen, amen, I say to you. You shall not enter the joy of your Lord, uh, the Pope, until you pay your last penny. Classic stuff. You, you know, you're not allowed in unless you have the money to offer us. Uh, and then eventually the Pope intervenes and says, brothers, be vigilant, lest anyone deceive you with empty words. My example I give unto you that you might grab just as I grab. So classic kind of, classic uh, piece of satire, classic anti anti-establishment stuff, uh, the Pope's a grabber, the Pope is a simoniac. Um, it reminds me though of this story, I think which is told by, um, this is like a Zizek anecdote, but you know, of, uh, people are praying and saying, oh, we're so humble, um, Lord, I am nothing, I'm worthless. And, and they're all quite rich people who are saying this. And then a poor person comes in and says, oh, I'm so worthless. And they say, who are you to say you're worthless? This is ridiculous, you, you have no right. There's that sort of uh, idea there. Um, so yes, all right, Dante continues this idea of simony, and we have a lot of popes in hell. Um, the punishment is uh, face down in a hole. Um, Saint Nicholas is in there, and he thinks that Dante is the next pope, Pope Boniface. Boniface, have you come already? The idea being that each time a new simoniac pope, like a, a corrupt pope comes in, uh, they replace uh, the last one, and the last one gets swallowed up by hell. Um, which wouldn't be so bad, actually. At least that's the end of the misery. Uh, but generally speaking, the reason I mentioned simony at the start of this capitalism lecture is because of this one paradox. This one paradox about the Wheel of Fortune, which is, you remember that fortune is blind. She's not actually depicted as blind here. But in, in these depictions, fortune is usually depicted as being blind. And the question is, um, is fortune random? Or is there some providence behind it? Is there actually some divine hand which leads things in life in, a, in terms of fate so that some people deserve high office and some people don't? Um, is there a providence at work or is it just random? Dante is quite interesting because in, in his early career, when he's less successful, his view is fortune is random. It's random, it's cruel and it's random. And his, but as he gets a bit more established, um, Dante starts to believe the opposite. Oh, it's providence. People do deserve it when they you know, because it's the divine hand. If you do have riches, then maybe you deserve them. Maybe it's God's way of saying, well done. The reason I mention this is both of these are fairly, you know, anti, 
social mobility. Well, maybe the second one is less so, but there's a kind of a very cynical discourse about who gets where in society. Louis, your, your hand is raised. Let's, let's hand you the microphone. He's uh, reading um, the book by Max Weber that we all have to read here for great books. I was struck by the fact that, you know, much of the battles of the Protestant churches, or many, many of them at least, for instance, the Calvinist and, and the uh, related churches, was over this debate, is there predestination and do we have a free will um, and related questions. So what was, I mean, this was a huge philosophical theme and theological theme in, in 17th century and so on. What, what here in the early mid, or, or in, in the 12th century or this period. So you say that there was not really belief in predestination, was not a general? Louis, we've been waiting for you to come to ask this question uh, because free will comes up quite a lot. And I'm, I apologize to the folks on Zoom because we did have this last week, but I will just for you. Um, the idea is a complex one. You do have free will, but you, do, but you need to ally it with God's will. How does this work? It's like a very, very strong, sorry guys on Zoom, this is identical words to last week. Uh, but basically, it's like a strong wind is blowing, and that is God's will. It's a very strong wind. And you have two options. You, and you're in a boat. Option one is you can put up your sail, and you can say, right, God's will, direct me. Okay, so you can have the free will to choose to build a sail and allow God's will to blow into that sail and guide you to providence. All right? So, in other words, you have the free will to do enough to get on the train to, to God's will. All right? Your other alternative is build your own boat, get out your oars, and just struggle against God's will wherever it takes you. And this is a very medieval idea. Essentially, um, that's sin. That's the definition of sin. So, it's a real trap. You have free will, but you better use it the right way. So you don't really. <laughs> you have free will. You can choose to struggle against God's will. Um, but his will is stronger. Uh, maybe that's the way to understand it. Okay. Let's move on to the heart of the matter. Let's move on to capital. I mean, this is immensely important, isn't it? I mean, what, what are the origins? It's a, again, it's a shame Tom Ash is not here. What are the origins of modern banking? What are the origins of capital exchange? What are the origins of those ways of thinking about charging interest, bookkeeping, accounting, organizing things so that profit can be maximized, I suppose. What is it? Um, and there is a fair argument to make that it is this period. If we just take, and we needlessly have more coins, if we just take, for example, uh, banking, well, where does the word bank come from? Uh, the banker, these are the benches that money lenders, uh, money exchangers rather, sit on in places like this, Lucker, uh, town square. And so the idea is you come from overseas or from somewhere else, you've got a strange kind of money, you go to this guy and he'll say, oh, this is what that's worth, let me exchange it with you. Um, so and these banker, that's the name of these benches that they sit on. Uh, Looker, by the way, um, carved in the cathedral, this is from the 1111, you can see down there. So um, you have already this reminder to anyone who's in the square, traders, commit no theft, no trickery, uh, and no falsification. It's already there. Um, but okay, so you have these, these uh, money exchanges. It's kind of very small scale. Banking really begins in like the 1150s. In Venice in 1157, we have the first bank that we might consider a state bank, state, state funded. So not just small, like you might have very small organizations before this, like, all right, um, Chris and I agree to, you know, here, here's a small loan, you know, you can take that and maybe at Christmas time, you know, well, I'll have it back. You know, you have small negotiations like that, but something more large scale and organized is it's the 1150s and it's Venice, uh, really. What can I say about it? Um, at this stage, we are seeing small loans, commercial enterprises, uh, punts, if you like, like, all oh, right, sounds like you need to build some ships. Well, I'll lend you this money to, you know, to build the ships and then we'll see where we go from there. So it starts out quite small. Um, then we have something like the Gran Tavola Bank, uh, Siena. Again, you see it's named Big Table. Um, this is like the, the largest bank in the 13th century, 1255. This is, um, this is the banker himself, uh, the guy who organized it. Here is someone begging to him. So already, he's already depicted as, you know, in this, um, in this way, uh, the great benevolent figure. Uh, that's in the 1250s. Uh, and here are some of the first sort of debts and loans. 
uh, that we have here in manuscript form. And what you notice about all of that, I'm sure, is it's, where's it all happening? It's all happening in Italy, the Italian peninsula. Um, this is, and now, now let's go to two historians, because two historians offer us two different visions of why all this is happening, when it's happening, and how it happens. And, and the thing we're talking about here is the commercial revolution. Uh, what Ro uh, Robert Lopez calls the commercial revolution of the Middle Ages. That's a fantastic book, it's a classic. Of course it's very old now, but it is a classic. We'll move on to Spafford in a second. And Lopez made that point, you know, the drive for all of this commerce is Italian. It's in the Italian peninsula, and there's certain facets and factors in Italy that mean that this could be the cradle of capitalism. Maybe you can think of a few of them now. Maybe, Zoomers, you can think of a few of those factors. What is it about the Italian peninsula that makes it perfect as a cradle of, uh, of European capital? Um, there's so much to say. I remember we said in the previous lecture that Egypt, you know, is also the perfect cradle for this kind of commerce because it links the Red Sea with the Mediterranean, it links the Silk Road uh, to the east with the, you know, slightly pathetic, <laughs> you know, at the early stage, uh, European network of trade. Well, Italy does more than that, I think. Um, there's lots to say about the Italian peninsula and Robert Lopez, he, he basically said there are two reasons why capitalism begins or the commercial revolution begins where it does and how it does. One of them is the particular nature of Italy and the other one is uh, the influence of, of Jewish people uh, and uh, entrepreneurship. But that is also an Italian phenomenon. Okay, so Italy is of course maritime. Um, I, I would almost go down here, uh, second. It is a post-feudal nobility. What does that mean? There's not that much agriculture in the Italian peninsula relatively. It's much, much, much more urbanized Obviously, the residue of the Roman Empire. This is, a, this is a country which is stacked with cities in a way that France is not uh, at, this, uh, at this stage. The Low Countries, Louis, of course, is another densely urbanised place. So that will come into our story. That's more 14th century, right? Just say that into the mic, if you could. Professor, that's 14th century. Ah, you're quite right, Louis. You're quite right. Um, there is a wonderful book by Adrian Verholst on this, comparing Italy and, and the North. Um, OK, yes. Um, what else to say? It's urbanised. It is, it is multicultural. I think that's an important thing to say about Italy. Um, it is, by its nature, it is actually an entre... What do they call it? Entrepot? Um, entrepot? That's a steak, isn't it? No, no, no. <laughs> I'm being silly. Um, it, it's a, a meeting place. It's a confluence point for different people from around Europe and the Mediterranean. There are... Uh, there are Muslims and Arabs in Sicily. There are... Um, People from the east of, of Europe all gravitate towards Venice up here. Um, it's a maritime coming and going kind of place. Um, and that happens increasingly when Jewish people get uh, um, exiled, or what's the word, uh, evicted um, from different parts of Europe, expelled from different parts of Europe. A lot of them do end up in places like Venice. It's, it's multicultural from the start. And this, this is important. You know, it not only means that you've got more kind of, I suppose, more of an emphasis on commerce. Uh, there's much more money lending as well, which is forbidden to Christians uh, at this point. Um, uh, the resources, though, are also crucial. Venice, actually, Italy has stuff uh, that other parts of Europe don't, that people in the, trade, the greater trade network um, in Asia, Northern Africa, want. There are metals. There's timber, yes. Salt and glass, very important, particularly glass. Um, and Venice is wonderful for glassware. So there are commodities that people want overseas. It's already maritime. It's already multicultural. Um, there's, and it's urbanized. So there's less like, well, you can't rely so much on an agricultural economy. So a lot of these conditions, I think, do make Italy quite unique. OK, so that's Robert Lopez's argument. Why, what, where does the commercial revolution begin? Don't worry, we'll talk about the mechanics of how that revolution actually happens, whether it is a revolution, blah, 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 in a second. Just to go to another part of Europe. Um, are there other reasons why you might get a revolution of commerce in the 12th and 13th centuries? And here, here we need to think very materially, very materially. Louis, you have a guess. Maybe warfare? Warfare. Well, actually, now you're right. Now I think about Mohammed and Charlemagne, that famous book by, um, by Henri Perrin. You know, there is a good argument that... Um, Oh, and it was a different book as well, Mark Bloch, Feudal Society. There's an argument, yes, uh, there's actually a period of relative peace in Europe. Um, you, the Vikings have all, have all gone. <laughs> that was serious. You know, European economic development was enormously stymied by Vikings and others. Um, that's a separate argument. Of course, there's also a movement not to call the Vikings violent warriors, to also consider them as, in fact, um, 
entrepreneurs who bring law and so on. Yes, this is another discussion. Um, but yes, I wouldn't make warfare the factor, uh, but it's a factor. There's some relative stability. It is the golden age. Well, it's, what do they call it? The springtime in the Middle Ages. It's the 12th century, the summertime in the Middle Ages of the 13th. Um, in the sense that there's a population boom, there's good weather, there are big harvests. All of those things are important. But there's something more material than that, the most material of things. This is Freiburg. This is not 1161, but something's discovered there in 1161. You can maybe imagine what this is. If we go underground, we see we are talking about... Um, we're talking about uh, uh, silver. The discovery of silver, this huge silver mine in Freiburg in the 1160s. So the argument for Peter Spufford in his book about money and its uses is that this is what really brings the commercial revolution of the, of the 13th century, is the actual discovery of this enormous commodity. Well, think about it. I mean, it, it, it's pretty simple. The silver, there's something that people outside of the European trade network want which is what had been lacking. If you think about the era of the Silk Road, and there's a famous book called Beyond European Hegemony uh, by Janet Abu Lagood, which makes the point over and over again, and pretty well, that from the global perspective, Europe is essentially just a bunch of, of quite boring peninsulas. With, you know, it's, it's, it's a sort of backwater at the edge of things. The real heart of trade and commerce is the Silk Road. It's from China all the way through Central Asia, where we are now, uh, down to sort of Turkey. Um, Europe, it's unimportant. Why? It just does not have the commodities. What, what could they possibly provide? Wool. Wool is important, and it does make its way generally across there, but it's not enough. With the discovery of silver, suddenly there's something. There's something people want. There's something that you can start selling uh, thousands of miles away, or giving, or using, or trading thousands of miles away. Spufford does some interesting work here, and this is what we talk about, about a commercial revolution. It's people using money for the first time, an abstract mechanism for, for the way you live your life rather than doing everything in kind. So rather than, right, I'm going to work, I'm going to do all of this work for you, my Lord, uh, Lord Vavort, I'll do all my work for you and in kind you give me all the food I need, the shelter I need, the protection I need. You know, this is more what well, we call quote unquote feudal economy. But increasingly we see by the 1200s, it's not like that anymore. Now it's, I work for you, Lord Vavort, thank you so much, I do all this work, and you'll give me some cash, which is fantastic. Or it's not fantastic, it depends, there are two arguments. It's either the best thing that ever happened, or you're actually leading me to poverty and famine. How could you? Uh, they're two different views. Um, anyway, Baumberg Abbey, Bavaria, Spufford does some good work here. Um, this is kind of grunt work that you have to do as a medieval historian. Uh, around about the year 1200, all the rent is in agriculture, right? All the rent that you pay is in terms of agriculture. So, I, you know, all of that payment, there's no money being changing hands uh, in this abbey. By 1245, it's 75% cash rent. That's in just 45 years, everything is in cash. You know, like we had the uh, cashless revolution recently, you know. But we're still probably not at 75% of transactions. Or maybe we are. But anyway, that feels like quite a big revolution. That's the level of revolution that's happened in the 13th, 13th century. Um, I've got this silly map uh, to show you how European capitalism begins. And it's, it's, it's the mundane material factors that are interesting here, which are, it's all about things like repairing roads. Repairing roads is key to this. Making sure there's actually a spine that stretches through Europe where you can actually sell things. It sounds so simple, but it's not. Um, you know, you get some bad rain and you can't get it. doesn't matter how much silver you've got in a mine in Freiburg. You can't get it to Venice. It's not going there. And how's it going to get over the Alps? Well, a lot of the grunt work is done in the 1200s where we get this. And this is going to be very scientific now. Uh, this... This is, this is, these are the major networks. And we're talking about major roads, big, big roads, which are built, maintained, upkept between different parts of Europe, uh, like the, the Fossway here going up uh, through the spine of England. Um, why all this activity here? Um, you have these fairs that begin. The other question is, of course, where, where is the sort of the hub? Where are the central hubs of, com of commerce? Um, it's Champagne, actually, in France and other parts of France around there uh, where you get these fairs that begin. Around about the 1220s, 1230s, you have people 
um, having these great fairs, you know, so that you can buy and sell things that you're going to send on to the wider trade network, um, which wasn't there before. As you can see, the sea routes really develop. I'm sad that Tomash is not here because I know he loves the, um, uh, the what do they call them again? The Hanseatic League. I know, so it's a shame. Uh, he could have told us more about that. But this is the era of the Hansa, maybe a little bit later. Um, you know, developing great uh, dominance in the sea economy up here. Um, the maritime economy developing around here. Um, and of course, Italy at the heart of it all. So this is the commercial revolution. Now, what does it depend upon? Yes, there's silver from Freiburg and other places. Yes, there is wool. There's always been wool, stuff like wool up here. And yes, that is going over to uh, this wonderful part of Europe here where it's being made into cloth. So yes, we'll get there in one second. Um, a lot of it though, guys, is small industry, very, very small industry, small scale stuff. Like ourselves, ourselves in this era, in our own back gardens, not that we have gardens, but you know, in our, in our common space, or in our own homes, choosing to make products, products that we think that might be viable to sell. And my favorite example of this, and I'm not, not picking on you, Louis, but um, it's one of my favorite beers, and maybe you like it too. Uh, it's Leffe, Leffe, this, this wonderful beer here. But it's no coincidence, if you look at the label, look, it is, it is the year, what is it, 1240? That's when it begins, it begins. It's like, it's like one of the first great products of the commercial revolution. It's such a great product, isn't it? But it's one of the first great products. Uh, and it's an example, it's this small scale, this is how that revolution begins. Small scale trade, small scale projects, like a few monks deciding we're gonna brew a beer and we're gonna sell it across Europe. And that's how it begins. People in their own houses saying, we're gonna start brewing. Actually, there's a lot of women who do this. This is like one of the great moments of women's labor in the Middle Ages um, that's been uncovered by historians. Like, it's a lot of brewing, which is it's women who are doing this. Uh, widows, and things like that, who make all their money by brewing beer and things like that and selling it on, on the market. Um, so just to quickly like, do a survey, yes, there's a lot of sheep involved. If we go over to Eastern Europe, there's an awful lot of wool and sheep and stuff like that. Um, and also in the north of England. And this depends upon a larger network because what you do with that wool, as I say, you send it to Flanders, you send it to the Low Countries. Um, this is obviously Van Eyck, and this is obviously one of the, great, the greatest uh, representations of cloth, I think, in Western art, isn't it? It's these luxurious folds of beautiful green cloth on, on the, uh, the wife's um, dress. Uh, this is classic uh, Low Countries labor, craft. Take the wool of these coarse parts, <laughs> take the, wool, uh, the coarse wool of England or Eastern Europe and weave it into a very fine cloth and then sell that as a new product. Everyone wins. The peasant farmers in the north of England with their wool, they win. You, the Flanders merchant, you win. Everyone wins because they're working together, because it's, uh, it's a commercial network for once, rather than something which is quite haphazard. It is, depending of course on, depending of course, is there a question there? Oh, oh maybe not. Um, depending of course on, um, depending of course on, on there being a connection, on there being some network that can actually make this work. Um, okay, so there are those, those roots again. What do historians make of all this? How do we digest all of this? And also there's a big question beneath it all, which I love. The big question beneath it all is who wins precisely? There are winners and losers in all of this. Who is involved in this commercial revolution? Who is benefiting from it? And is it a genuine revolution in terms of throughout society we see people, people sort of the currents, if you like, rising or whatever? Is it, is, are a lot of people making money or not? And I suppose the question behind the question is, what about the peasantry? What about the medieval 90%? Are they involved in this commercial revolution or not? So this is why we go to Toronto. Um, there's a famous, there's the, the Toronto School uh, well, there are two schools. There's the Toronto School and the Birmingham School of Peasant Studies. Uh, and there are some great debates about this question. Um, actually, uh, Campbell, I'm not sure if he's from either. Um, so look, let's look at a couple of works. The Commercialising Economy, uh, this is by Bruce Campbell and, and R.H. Britnell. And this is a book that basically argues for the damaging nature of all this com commerce on ordinary people, on, on the medieval 90%, the paupers like ourselves in the Middle Ages. The argument is that for all this money and all this commercialization actually forces peasants to sell their own subsistence foods. All right? So it forces 
peasants to have less. The result is apparently great famines and, and poverty. Evidence, for example, in the greatest famine of the Middle Ages, which is 13, 15, 16, 17, it rains for 167 days in a row, we get a terrible famine. Three years of, of famine. Um, so, and for Campbell and Britnell, it's classic because why a lot of the excess product is being sold in order to make more cash. In other words, you start paying me less money than you, uh, normally I would have got enough crops and grain to survive, to subsist. But now we have a money system, you're paying me for labor. Well, it's a shortfall. It's not actually enough always to make, to buy the food I need, because I need to buy other things. I'm involved in a money economy. I now, I struggle. Uh, so that's one argument. It's Campbell and Britnell, and it, you know, it's, it's a, it's a good argument, and you can't, you can't deny it. A lot of people are suffering uh, through this uh, money economy. Let's look at the more positive end of the spectrum. Uh, Christopher Dyer, Chris Dyer. He's from the Birmingham School, uh, student of Rodney Hilton, great Marxist um, uh, historian of, peasant, of the medieval peasantry. Uh, for him, marketization brings peasant wealth. You know, peasants expand production, engage in entrepreneurship. So this is, and we'd associate this also with the, uh, the Toronto School of Peasant Studies too. Uh, trying to understand ordinary peasants as actors, as actors within the network of uh, medieval trade. Uh, they're not passive, passive victims like kind of Campbell and Britton will make them, but they're actors. They are entrepreneurs. They're the ones with the impetus. Your, you know, every every village has people in it who are profiting, who are thinking ahead, thinking about how to make a profit um, in um, in this commercial network. And finally, uh, my favourite. Um, is Marianne Kowaleski. She was one of my uh, professors in, in New York. She's at Fordham. I just admire her so much. Uh, but looking at her recent work, what makes it so wonderful is she actually does archaeological evidence. She's, she's looking at, um, well, as she says here, demography and bioarchaeology. That's biological an analysis of, of skeletons. I, Krishna, I, you know, you're, you're a scientist. I, I have no idea how this works. Like, I feel like this is the kind of collaboration we should be doing. Um, Maybe, maybe I could talk to Isla too. Um, but, uh, but yeah, she basically, you know, I, I'm not sure what she finds with the bioarchaeology, to be honest. But, um, there are a lot of interesting uh, things she discovers about gender. Um, but uh, she basically argues that we shouldn't make this hard split between town and country, um, that we need to see that actually it's not like the countryside is full of passive victims or entrepreneurs or whatever. And the town is this urbanized place. It's actually very, very fluid. Town and country are intimately linked. Uh, this economy, in other words, I suppose, what, what comes out of this is this economic revolution does benefit everyone uh, or has the potential to benef benefit anyone. There are still victims and so on. Is there a question from Zoom? There is. I think there's a question from Zoom. Uh, yes. Well, I have a question. Hi, Anne. Uh, as far as we know from the last week lecture on sloth, historians have much more paper evidence starting from uh, 12th century. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any relation between this fact and the commercial revol revolution of the 13th century we just discussed? Mm. Good question. Well, look. Um, yes, there is. Um, but the question is, which comes first? And this is the question. Um, so yeah, have, exactly. So what we have is something called functional literacy, which starts to develop in this period. So more and more people have a functional literacy, which is to say that they can do some bureaucracy if they have to. Like if they want to get a bank loan and they get given a slip of paper saying, this is what I owe, that they have enough literacy to be able to say, right, that's how much I owe. I can see it's written there. Um, so if they forget. Uh, the question, of course, is, is that something that comes because you get commerce, which necessitates it? Or do you get more functional literacy anyway, a general rising of literacy, literate rates, more document production, and that in itself you know, stimulates? Like, you know, I can, you know, you, it's thinkable to give people loans because we have the resources to do it and we know that they're able to read the stuff um, and enforce it. Well, no, because there are, of course there are other ways to make people remember their loans. And I always think of the famous example of agreements that are made, and then a child is brought, um, maybe you'll like this, or maybe you won't like this. They bring a child in, they say, right, Louis, I, sorry, sorry, Louis, I say, Louis, you know, I, I owe you 300 rubles, uh, and the way we're gonna remember how much I owe you is we're gonna say 300 rubles to this child, and then I'm gonna slap the child very hard. And then the child will always remember that day it got hit very hard in the face, and, it was, and then we'll ask it, 
Do you remember when you got hit in the face? Yes. What was the number? 300 rubles. So this is, it's a bit stupid, I know, but it's, um, it's, it doesn't really, but there are, and what I'm trying to say is there are other ways to remember a debt. Um, so maybe they're not so closely engaged. Thanks for the question, Anne. Uh, Julie has a question. Um, that's actually another uh, insight from great books class. Uh, according to Nietzsche, the book that we read for this class is that we only remember something when it hurts, when it's kind of written with blood, and this is how, how literacy came. So the whole idea of commerce, that you need to uh, make someone remember how much they own, so it's kind of supposed to hurt, and the literacy is a part of this process of traumatization and remembering. So human is the animals who remembers, and because uh, they feel pain and they don't want to feel pain. I like this, yes. Um, that's a good point. That's a good supplement uh, to this. That's a very good supplement. Yeah. The By the way, we have someone here who's doing research on, on this, Krishna, right? And <clears throat> I would just add a small remark, which is that sometimes you're, or often you re remember rather by pleasure than, than by pain, I would say. But that's, that's another discussion. Uh, uh, Julie has his last. Yeah, Julie, I know. Yeah, well, pain and pleasure are not different, it's just because it's something extraordinary. So it's not because of the stress, how it connects with... Stress is not normally, it's not necessary something bad, but just uh, not ordinary and something we need to pay more attention to, to adapt. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, we will move on. So is there capitalism in the Middle Ages? I'm, you know, I'm, the jury's out. What I would say, though, is there are the mechanisms there for, for a banking economy or economy that relies on, depends upon banking loans for build, big projects. Um, there are the documents present. Debt, we have debt and credit entering into social relations uh, at this point. We do have something like entrepreneurial spirit, uh, as we can see here. Um, and a lot of that is geared towards making small profits. Profits are important because people are starting to think about how to invest. Uh, and I think... Italy is the great example where people are speculating and saying, well, oh, you're going off on a ship. You're going right around North Africa. Let me give you these products. Um, and why don't you, you, you know, just in case you can sell them. And sometimes that leads to the next time, uh, oh, you're going to go and sell some products. Well, let me give you some money to help build your ships just to make sure that you definitely go because I really would like you to sell my things for me. Like you get that kind of speculative investment, expecting a return. So... Is it capitalism? Isn't it? it? Obviously, we shouldn't draw a hard line and say this is where capital begins. I mean, it would be silly. But it's definitely worth bearing in mind. It's definitely re worth remembering the 13th century. OK, reactions to this. This is the point I told you all that you could get back on the bus if you weren't really into the numbers. Um, this is the highest poverty. Um, this is one of, I think it's the, the strongest reaction against a commercialising economy that emerges, and it is the most radical. And it has to do with a certain disgust at material things, a certain disgust about the money economy, particularly the abstractions of money. Um, and it has to do with an ambition, which is to say, is it possible to live without it? You know who this figure is, because we talked about him so many times. Um, it's not Bernard of Clairvaux this time. Um, we're in Assisi, and we are with uh, St. Francis. Here he is. And I know, guys, I know Zoomers, we already talked about Francis of Assisi when we talked about pride. And of course, Francis is the anti-pride figure. He is the most humble. But he is, of course, also anti-commerce. Now, it's not necessarily Francis himself. It's his radical followers that we need to pay attention to right now. Because, so Francis of Assisi, for those of you who weren't here previously, um, what's important about Francis? He is the son of, an, of a merchant from Assisi. All right? He is somebody who is from a wealthy background. He has all his pals. He gets traumatized when he goes off to war and he gets imprisoned. He comes home, he's a bit depressed, I'll be honest with you. He has a vision of uh, Jesus on a cross. San Damiano speaks to him and says, my church is falling down, please build it again. Francis gives away all his possessions. He strips naked and says, I don't, you know, I don't want to live that old life anymore. I know my new mission is to just repair the churches of, uh, of, of Italy or whatever. Um, he then reluctantly has an order, and suddenly he, he's, yeah, he's the head. He's, he's, he's the head of a personality cult, the Franciscans, uh, the Friars Minor, the poor, the poor brothers, um, the lesser brothers. He gets even more depressed. Um, 
I don't think he's happy in this paradoxical role where he's the head of an order, but he wanted to be nothing. Francis really wanted to be abject. He wanted to be nothing. My favorite story about, I've got many favorite stories about Francis. One of my favorite stories is he, he hates having to be the head of an order. So he lies down on the floor whenever there's a meeting and he, like just, he just like grabs, he gets someone else to speak for him and he grabs them and just whispers and says, say this. And then they say, oh, Francis doesn't want to say because he's lying down, but um, we all need to do this. It's kind of silly. And maybe it's a little bit exhibitionist. Maybe it's a little bit arrogant. Oh, I don't know. There's always that paradox with Francis. Uh, there's a point from Julie. Yeah, do you have the microphone available? Yeah, it's actually coming back to your last lecture. I'm really good in bad questions, but I'm slow. <laughs> Uh, Francis, I mean, he. Uh, this is quite materialistic what he does, like lying down on the ground or rolling in the snow or putting whatever is called coil on his on his. Was it he who put the coil papil in his on his head? So it's like trying to be closer, more material in a way, and more. This is weird because you know what, where you were talking about last last lecture, being becoming more materialistic, more material. It's a sin, sinful, but on the other hand, this ascetic behavior is kind of this coincide with this thing. I agree with you, and I was thinking about it quite hard. I was thinking earlier, just the paradox is fascinating. The becoming matter, I agree. Is it becoming animal with Francis, or is it becoming... Um, is it, is it a performance where I'm going to become like animal, an animal? I'm going to throw myself onto the floor. I'm going to lick the ground. I'm going to strip, strip naked as his brother Giles does, and not his actual brother, one of the brothers, and just perform like a dog. You know, this, and is it, because, is it because I want to become one with nature or something like this? Talking to birds. <laughs> What's that? Talking to birds. Talking to birds, yes, that's famous. Or, um, and of course, apocryphal. Or is it... Um, Yes, because within it, there's this dual problem of becoming matter. As I said earlier, the thingification of the human in the discourse about materialism, like become too attached to gold and materials. And like Crassus, you'll have gold poured down your throat. Like uh, Midas, everything you touch will become deanimated. You know, you'll lose yourself to gold. You will become thing. Um, but the Franciscans show us another side of that, which is I want to become thing because... Um, because there's this view that, that is the ultimate humility of, of humanity, like the human is nothing. Um, and so to escape the trap of being a prideful human is to become abject, and to become abject is to become object too. Kind of it's a strange one. So like later Franciscans, like Angelo Fellini, who I mentioned right at the start of this lecture series, um, who sets fire to her own genitals, she talks about wanting to become quenched by the fire and become one with the fire. Margaret Perret takes it even further, not a Franciscan, but a kindred spirit. She talks about wanting to become the flame itself. I'm not sure what it is. I really don't know. I'm confused by it. But it's, there's a paradox. There are two kinds of becoming thing. One of them is completely satanic, and the other one has this other liberating hum humility to it. Louis? Yeah, I agree that I also see here different interpretations of, you know, the behavior of Francis. I tend to believe that we can trust, let's say, the commentators of, of the old times, that they were not all fooled, for instance, to believe that Francis was uh, giving a show and trying to attract attention, for instance, by all means. Um, but you cannot exclude it. It would be fantastic if some uh, psychologists would, you know, do a very detailed scientific study of all these things he did, and maybe they could shed light on it. Yeah. Oh, I know. I think, um, I think some have. I think there's a great big Francis industry. Um, I think the problem with Francis is a lot of people fall in love with Francis. <laughs> it's difficult. It clowns the judgment. Um, but look, I, I should move... Probably there are good reasons. I mean, not all these, these commentators uh, will have been fooled including those who, who uh, you know, had first, first-hand uh, observations and so on, so, yeah. Um, we, sh we should move on. I should say something about Francis and his followers. Again, sorry, Zoomers, you know this one. And this is, of course, the Portiancula, where the first church that Francis and his uh, first brothers had and made their own, they fixed it and it became their own space. And you know this already, the, great, the, the greatest paradox, the greatest travesty in Christian history in my book is what happens to the Porziuncula. And you know this, but maybe you in the room don't. It is a travesty. What do they do with the Porziuncula? What would you do? It's the poor church. It's where the Franciscans who had nothing, they wanted to be like the apostles, right? They wanted to be absolutely 
impoverished. They should own nothing, nothing at all. Nothing should be owned, no property. Um, and this church, they just use it. So, of course, the greatest travesty in Christian history is building an enormous church around that church uh, on top of it, okay? It's just ludicrous. Um, you already know this, Zoomers, but it, it's, it's the... Um, this is the problem of Franciscan history after Francis, which is how do you actually practice no poverty? And we talked about this in a previous lecture, but I'm going to go much deeper now. So the problem is how do you have no property? What is a life outside of property? What is a life outside of all commerce? What does it look like? The highest poverty, as, as, uh, as uh, Peter John Olivi calls it. Um, well, well, this is what it looks like. Um, oh, these are the apostles, by the way. Um, this is from Ravenna, it's where Dante's buried, uh, not where this mosaic is, but the same city. Uh, to live like the apostles, that was the idea. And the idea was, for Francis and his followers, that the apostles had genuinely lived with no property. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but this is the idea and it's central. Later on, that idea is called heretical. You will be burnt at the stake for saying it. But at this point in the 1200s, this is the idea. The apostles had nothing. We should try and live like the apostles. What does it look like? Well, there's this important idea, usus pauper, poor use. So this is how it operates. Okay, so you want to live a life where you own no property. So you live, in a, you live on the streets. Somebody comes up to you and says, you know, uh, Krishna, you look hungry. Here's, here's, you know, a cake or whatever. And that's fine. You can take what's given to you. You cannot ask for anything. You can take what's given to you. But if someone says, it's fine if it's a cake because you eat it. Do you, have, do you own something you eat or do you use it? Uh, this is actually the kind of debate which is wonderful when you get into it because it's not, it's not silly at all. It actually gets to the very essence of what property is. But, but okay, so it's easy when it's a cake. But if I say, Krishna, you look like you need a good sleep. Why don't you and your friends sleep here in this shed? You know, it used to belong to me. I don't need it anymore. Sleep here. So, okay, so this is where it gets more complicated. Do you now own that shed? And, and likewise, here's four bottles of wine. You and your lads, you can enjoy that over the next week. Do you now own the bottles of wine? What happens if you give one of those to someone else? So, you know, you can say that you're going to live in absolute poverty. I will own nothing. But the reality is you're going to, you're going to be caught very quickly into a tangled mess of what counts as property and what doesn't. Um, but... And so what then happens, inevitably, Franciscans start saying, well, look, there's got to be some, you know, you can make small use of things or you can, you can, you can have some, or what, no, I'll tell you what happens, is you have pro, uh, what do we call them, uh, procurers, procurers. So that is to say, all right, we have this shed here now um, that I've given to Krishna. Krishna is a good Franciscan, says he doesn't own the shed. Who owns the shed? Well, the cop out is you say, well, my procurer owns the shed, my procurer which might be Louis, who might be someone who's a friend to the Franciscans, who now will own all of the property. So the question is, right, are you the four bottles of wine? Well, they're actually Louis' bottles of wine. We're just going to use them. Does this count as poverty? Is this actual poverty, or is this just a game? And this is really where, and maybe I'm mad, but I find these debates some of the most exciting debates in medieval history. Why? Because, well, actually, it, it, for a start, we have one of the best writers that's ever lived, um, Peter John Olivi. I just find reading him, it is clear as crystal. Here is someone who is totally honest, totally honest, and he rips into this idea of user's pauper. Uh, well, in fact, he mentions user's pauper, which is poor use, which is this idea that you only use things and there are procurers and so on. And he looks at it with an honest eye and he asks himself at every turn, and what is the honest spirit of this? What is, where is your spirit when you do this? So when we have a procurer who owns something for you, Olivia says, no, don't allow it to happen because you're starting to think like a lawyer. You're starting to say, well, there's a rule by which we're playing and we're within those rules, so it's okay. So, so with the shed and so on. Okay, so the procurer now owns the shed uh, and you, you sleep in the shed. This is wrong for Olivia. Why? Because you are saying, well, there's a loophole, essentially, which allows us to stay in this shed because it's not really ours. So therefore, we can use it. We can make poor use of it. But for Olivia, this must stop. So look, for him, poor use is the highest exile, peregrination and mendicancy. And the ideal of poor use, which is that you only use things, you never own them, is to exterminate from the foundation the roots of avarice and its tricks and stratagems. 
So the answer, guys, is to say, no, we'll sleep in this shed now, but not again. The answer is to never accept that you have any ownership at any level, uh, not because somebody else has it, but not even to be in a position where you're comfortable that you know you could do that again. So with the four bottles of wine, you either drink them now or you throw them away. You don't say, we'll have another one tomorrow. Because the key to all this, and it, maybe it's crazy, is do not think about tomorrow. And maybe this is where we're becoming animal. Um, the key for the Franciscans, the, at the most radical end of the spectrum, is if you really want to fight want, if you really want to fight uh, greed and avarice, you have to say, I will never think about tomorrow. I will never think about what I might need later. Because that, for them, that's where Olivia gets. That's where he ultimately gets in these wonderful questions on evangelical perfection, to a point where that is the key, that is the crux of the issue. Thinking ahead is the problem. So when you're greedy, you're thinking ahead. So in a strange way, seizing a moment and saying, this is all I have, is the answer to fighting this. It's easier said than done. Peter John Olivia was later condemned as a heretic. Uh, Louis, you have a question? Well, I suppose that Peter uh, Olivi uh, uh, violated his own rule by, because if you want to write a book, you need some property and you need to plan a bit and think about the future. I think he goes here a little bit against, you know, all that is human. We humans need to plan and, and to have some possessions, even, but you know, you, it can be scarce possessions. You can be, you know, very uh, moderate. And I mean, I don't really see this, this extreme position here of, of Olivi as something that's re realistic. You sound just like Pope Clement V. Okay, this is exactly what he said. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> pope Clement V, a great French pope, um, made a similar point. Uh, in fact, lots of critics made the same point. It's just not, it's not livable, it's not viable. But of course, that's the problem of Franciscanism. It's not livable, it's not a livable system. And that's what, but that's what makes it, precisely the problem there is system. Um, it's possible to just live that life at some level. It's very hard to actually make it something that's organized and works. I think Julie has a question. Uh, I don't have a question, this time I have a solution. <laughs> so, um, so what uh, Francis did is like mortification of the flesh and the idea that the death, we can't actually possess anything because we will die. There is no way we can possess it because it, it doesn't belong to us. We are going to disappear and all of this stuff is going to be unimportant. So. Uh, final death, uh, not a final death, but the death as uh, equal, which is equal to everyone, and the process of life as dying. Therefore, it's just impossible that something will belong to us. It's just illusion. This greed is, is illusion. Death is solution. <laughs> well, but that sounds like a very sophistic point, Julie, because uh, let's we can agree that the Pope at that time owned much more than, you know, uh, let's say, uh, Francis, right? I mean, I, mean, yes, I think so you can make a distinction. You look ahead to um, the dance of death in the 14th century, after the Black Death, where we get this lovely, these murals, which always show the same thing. Bishop, king, peasant, everyone's going to die. We're all going to die. We're all in a dance together. A dance where, doesn't, where basically our status is just, they're just clothes. They're just silly, fancy dress clothes. The, the status we have in our life. We're all just ashes. And this is quite a common theme in, you know, in, during pandemics. <laughs> so uh, we'll talk about that towards the end. Um, well, look, it's not practicable. This is a problem. It's an intellectual problem which is not solvable. That's what makes it so exciting. Um, you, know, you say you want absolute poverty. Well, like you say, well, you need a pen to write with. But then Olivia would say, I made use of that pen because I needed to write it, and then it's not mine. This document I wrote, people needed it. Uh, I have poor use, which is, use is pauper, that's what that is. Poor use. Poor use means I make use of things. That's all I do. It's only use, only use. Never ownership, only use. Makes sense. Okay. So, but yes, the condemnations are thick and fast and violent, all right? They are violent. Where do we end up with all this? We end up with these four guys being burnt to death in Marseille in 1318. These are the Fraticelli, the spiritual Franciscans. There's only four, I would say there were about 100 of them who were rounded up, and most of them said, all right, fine, I'll own stuff. These were the four hardcore ones that refused to the very end. They said, well, you can't force me to live a life I don't want to live. 
Um, this is Pope John the Twenty Second. I didn't say you sound like Pope John the Twenty Second, which was a great compliment, uh, because this man they thought was Antichrist. Here he is. Um, Pope John the Twenty Second is the one who puts the stop to this game. No more claiming that you own nothing. Pope John doesn't want this anymore. He's a complicated character, Pope John the Twenty Second. Uh, why do they make him out to be Antichrist? Oh, look, there's, it looks like fraud there again, doesn't it? Um, well, he, when the Holy Roman Emperor is dead, John the Twenty Second says, well, maybe the Pope should be the Emperor too. So I think for many, <laughs> that's enough to explain why a lot of people thought he was Antichrist, like usurping power, uh, the, the secular sword. Uh, but this is where it ends. It's a serious deal. And it ends with this, this, this piece of wax, um, this is, uh, this is Pope John XXII's seal, and this is the most dramatic way I could find of... <laughs> this is the most dramatic way I could find of showing the papal bull that he sends, uh, which is queer quorundum uh, in uh, 13... Is it 24? Yeah, 1324. And this is where he finally puts an end to the game. Indeed, he says, uh, it can be inferred rather that the gospel life lived by Christ and the apostles did not exclude some possessions in common since living without property does not require that those living thus should have nothing in common. So basically, in a nutshell, stop saying that the, gospel, uh, that the apostles lived with no property. They did have property, and that's the end of the story. And after this bull, it's now a heresy to claim that Christ and the apostles had no property. If you say that Christ lived in total poverty, it's now heretical to say that. Pope John makes it so. Um, Pope John is the one, of course, who burns the spiritual Franciscans. And it's the end of the game. It's a long game. That game has been going on since Francis died. It's a 100-year it's a game of trying to claim that the highest poverty is livable. And it's played by people like my favourite poet among them, uh, who's Jacopone de Todi, who is the one who does the spider dance, you know, on the, you know um, and stuff like this. What, what is it? What's the spider dance? Um, it's mucking around. It's hum self-humiliation. Uh, again, becoming naked and dancing like a spider, um, in total embarrassment to yourself um, in a public occasion. This is Jacoponi's way. So he tries to live this total humiliation, total poverty, and he's thrown in prison for it. And he writes some wonderful poems. Again, where did he get the pen? It's a good question, Louis. Um, the, um, just to point out Agamben, Agamben has written a book about the highest poverty. For him, as I say, these debates and people like Peter John Olivi, they are a the locus where a way of thinking outside of Homo Seca takes place, which is Agamben's great philosophy, philosophical project, Homo Seca. Um, but essentially a way to think about living a life without a rule, to live without the law, to live without regulation, um, a form of life. Um, what does it mean? Well, it, debates about only using things, you can see the immediate application to um, what we would have called a communist idea. Of, of social organization will only have use, will never own anything. For Agamben, this is like the most radical experiment in that, more radical than communism itself, because there was common ownership. To live just for today, only using, is a blueprint for something which has never come, which could be possible. And to think outside of law and regulation, well, that's my favorite part of this. Um, to say, I will not do the good because it says it in the rules, I will not, because for, for you saw with someone like Peter John Olivi, the rules are the problem. Because once, because once you say, I'm going to do what the rules allow me to do, you already start to manipulate the space between morality and rule. Uh, that space where you can get with what you can get away with, if you like. The things you can get away with within the rules. Thinking outside a framework of rules allows for something much more radical. A total embodiment of morality. And uh, a total embodiment of... of of living a fair life, a good life. Okay, I realize I've spoken for way too long on all of these issues. I hope you're all with me still, uh, people on Zoom. Um, I'm going to talk really briefly about discovery because, you know, it's part of this story. It's part of the story of commercialization. So the Franciscans, the radical Franciscans, they are like a rebellion against the commercial revolution. They are crushed. All right? They do not have any purchase. They're not a mass movement that survives into the 1400s or anything like that. It's gone. Sad as it may be, they are gone. The spirit of... It's still a Franciscans today. Oh, we're so still a Franciscans back. today, but they do not claim radical uh, okay. poverty. They, you know, they, they do not claim the highest poverty, if you like. 
Maybe some of them do. I suppose it's not really such a big deal to be considered a heretic by the terms of that papal bull from 1324. Maybe it is. Um, discovery. Okay. This is the world in um, 13, in uh, the 1270s. Well, it's not. It's the world now. But uh, just to say something about commerce and how it extends beyond Europe, because I feel like we've been a bit too European focused. So you can get off the bus now, the poverty fans and maybe <laughs> the commerce fans can get back on the bus. Um, just to say a couple of things about the world in the time of this commercial revolution. What is happening in this part of the world at that time, in the 1200s? Silver, silver. Ah, yes, but who are the great heroes of the Silk Road? The greatest, um, the greatest business people of the 12th, 1200s? The Mongols. Louis, you're right, the Mongol Empire. Um, I love this because I once did a class um, at NYU uh, on global Asia, on the Asian, uh, on global Asian trade. And um, a lot of the students wrote papers about how great the Mongols were. Genghis Khan was brilliant because he linked up the trade networks of Asia. Um, and so this is the new narrative of Genghis Khan. We no longer, it's no, or Chinggis Khan. We no longer emphasize the, how the number of skulls made into mountains, the number of people killed. Uh, we emphasize now the trade. <laughs> He's a great symbol of, that's globalization. Globalization has made Chinggis Khan a hero. Um, but anyway, the Mongol Empire is here. Um, and, you know, um, I'm sure you're aware that in the year 1241, Europe is almost consumed by the Mongol, uh, the Golden Horde. Um, Heaven forbid, but it doesn't happen. Uh, so this is a serious, uh, this is a serious neighbor. Uh, yes, the Mongols are connecting up the trade networks in new ways because one big empire over that whole network makes things a much more easier, much more fluid trade. So hats off to them for that. Um, Christians are a little bit worried. Some of them are quite excited. A lot of them are really scared. Um, one of them who's probably all three is William, uh, John of Plano Carpini. He's a Franciscan. He, he's not one of the highest poverty Franciscans. He's one of the mainstream Franciscans who just accepts, right, we need to have some common ownership, blah, blah, blah. Um, but anyway, he and his friend, whose name I forget, go on a trip to visit the Great Khan. They go on foot uh, between these years, 1245 and 52. It takes seven years. I know Tom Ash has driven from Chimin to Poland, uh, which I was impressed with. And his car broke down, too. It's pretty bad. But, um, but this is an even more heroic journey, even more heroic. Um, so this is the route. Am I going to show you the route? I think I am. It's from Lyon, they set out, all the way to Ordu, and then eventually to Karakorum. Um, what I love about this mission is they have a message from the Pope. They want to convert the Mongols to Christianity, <laughs> and they're going to do it, just two of them, two Franciscans. So it's a, it is, I mean, it's a ridiculous mission, uh, but it's an exciting one. And the great thing about it is we have the letters survive, the letter they sent to the Great Khan, but also the letter the Great Khan sent back. It's like one of these great moments uh, of contact uh, between two different worlds, if you like, uh, that survive. Um, yes, they make their way across seas. Yes, they make their way across the snowy planes. Yes, they make their way uh, through, you know, I'm, Chaclo, you've been here recently enough, I think. <laughs> yes, um, uh, Samarkand. And um, yes, they make their way um, across deserts too. And they do meet the Great Khan. And they do send him a note. And I just love the response. I think the response is just so wonderful. Uh, this is Guruk Khan. And his response is simple. And maybe it's the same response we would give. How do you know that such words as you say are with God's sanction? How do, you, how, how do you guys know that you represent God sending me this letter from some pope? From the rising of the sun to its setting, all the lands have been made subject to me. Who could do this contrary to the command of God? Back to the wheel of fortune, really, aren't we? Um, it must be providence. Here's somebody who, uh, who dominates the entirety of the vastest continent. Um, and, you know, and now you two sort of lads are coming from some Italian bishop telling me that you know, you, I must convert to your religion. Why don't you convert to my religion? I've subjected the whole of this continent to myself. So good will of fortune there. Um, okay, so it's not the end. And um, probably uh, the more famous adventurer from this period that you might know is Marco Polo. So I thought I'd say just a couple of words about him. And then it really is the end, except there's a bonus disc, uh, bonus track at the end. Okay, so Marco Polo, very quickly, think of what you know about Marco Polo. Did he even go on the trip? So, you know, this is a guy from Venice who goes all the way, much like those friars, only he spends 20 years doing it. He goes with his dad first time, and he goes back with his brother, I think. Um, 
this is Venice where he sets up. This is Venice, um, not quite contemporary, but a little bit later depiction of Venice. A lot of swans, more swans than I imagine in Venice. I don't know if anyone can confirm whether that's true or not. Are there swans in Venice, Louis? No, well, there were in the 1200s. Um, Venice is obviously prime for someone like Marco Polo to, to make a trip like this. Um, as we mentioned earlier, it's got the commodities. It's got the multicultural traders who are interested in paying for this kind of thing. It's got, um, it's got, uh, it's got sailors. It's got shipbuilding. It's got everything. Um, it's also got sort of knowledge of maritime, the maritime world. It's from Venice and places like this that we have like these portland charts. So genuine navigational techniques, not those maps that you might have seen before where like Jerusalem's in the center and it's all a devotional map and you never find your way home with it. This is a genuine, accurate map. I mean, more accurate than anything I could make. Um, so Venice has all of this. Marco comes from this society. He is interested in trade. He makes this journey. He makes these several journeys. Uh, sorry, this is not in English, but uh, from Venice. You can see the routes he takes. He ends up, uh, he ends up at the court in Xi'an uh, for quite a while uh, with, with the Khan. And he works for him as a, as a functionary. Uh, and he goes home. Some people have argued he never did any of it. Um, the book is, the Marco Polo's Travels is a fascinating work. There's one argument it never happened. And the reason is, and it's ludicrous, the reason one historian is given, can you imagine? He went to China and uh, this historian claims that because he never mentions chopsticks or tea, it must be made up. Because Marco wouldn't forget to mention that. Okay, so it is a bit silly. And so, like, but of course, the historian's argument goes a bit further. Like, you could have got all of this information from other places. So it's possible. If he had a really good library, he might not have gone. What's interesting, if you read The Travels of Marco Polo, is his eye. He is drawn to how much things are worth, to the commodities themselves. It's a real snapshot of the psychology of a merchant in this period. Um, I suppose I don't have much more to say about Marco. This is his church that he, uh, this is his local church, by the way. I don't have much more to say about Marco, I suppose. Um, it is just a great symbol of 13th century travel. It makes a good contrast with travels like the travels of John Mandeville a little bit later, a more popular book where it's just full of fantastic creatures. So you go on travels and you meet creatures with eyes in their chests, creatures with enormous feet and enormous ears. You probably zoom as you remember me talking about those before. Um, that was a more popular work. And actually, Christopher Columbus, when he goes on his adventures, he's much more familiar with John Mandeville and the stories of crazy, cr crazy monsters and creatures at the edge of the world. That's what he's expecting. He's not familiar with Marco Polo. Uh, so it's something to bear in mind. There are two kinds of travel guide that you can get in the Middle Ages. One is, you know, basically meeting creatures from out sp outer space in China. And the other is Marco Polo's sort of forensic merchant's eye, which looks at commodities for how much they're worth. That's the end of commerce. This is now the bonus track, uh, which is the Black Death. And I thought I'd mention it because we're talking about trade networks. Oh, what wonderful things. But we should also bear in mind they also bring something else, uh, which is death um, and pandemics in particular. This is just, uh, as I say, the, the end, the end of it all. Um, I thought I'd say something about this because precisely, uh, precisely that trade network which commercializes Europe which brings so much wealth and connection, is conversely also the thing which brings the pandemic so fast. I'm obviously not making some simplistic point about globalization leads to you know, pandemics. I'm sure the Black Death would have come thick and fast without a commercial network, but still it came and still it traveled that way. Um, let's look at it. it is, um, I also thought that if I didn't mention it here, we might not talk about the Black Death at all, and that would have been sad. And I don't think we can study the Middle Ages in 2020 without talking about this most terrible of pandemics. Um, just briefly, really briefly. The date of the Black Death? Quiz question. Yeah. Uh, come on, Erica. I know. Oh, wait, no, no, I should know. It's 13, uh, 20, no, 2035, 20, 25? Just a little bit, little bit later. 1345. Oh, so close, yes. 13, Orcania, the Orcania. 1345, I'm sure somebody has the Black Death already, but 1347 to 1351. So 
depending on which part of Europe, if you speak to an Italian, they might, or you speak to someone from uh, Turkey, they might say 1347. You speak to an English person, they say 1349. Oh, what a terrible year. Um, it comes in this wave. Um, it comes, I, I always tell the students that, you know, actually, and it, maybe it is true, that uh, Omsk is the first city. To, <laughs> but it's not, no, it's not Omsk. But uh, it comes from the plains, the steppe. It comes from Central Asia. It comes from, it could be Uzbekistan, it could be Kazakhstan, it could be the Caspian Sea, it could be Chimin, I'm sorry guys, let's, let's be honest, it could be. Um, it comes from somewhere here. It's not China. The claims are, oh, it's the Chinese virus. This is, this is the claim in 1347, 1348. I don't think it's China, for good reason. And um, there's been some good studies on this. Louis? Did it also have an animal origin? It did have an animal Probably, origin. Probably, yeah, rats, I think, no? Aha, uh -huh, yes, yes, it is rats. Okay, so this is how it spreads. I just thought it'd be fun for you to guess where it goes next. In 1346, um, so really 1346, I suppose, is the first. I mean, as I say, somebody's probably got it in 1345 in Omsk. But 1346, it's here. Uh, it's on the other side of the Caspian. It's on the Black Sea. 1347 is when it really enters Europe proper. It goes, as you can see, through Asia Minor, through Greece, down here to Sicily, and then up into the Balkans. Matvey's not here. Uh, to talk about the Balkans, but that, that's where it is in 1347. You see, it follows the trade routes. It goes through all the ports, North Africa, along the coast. In Genoa, in 1348, Genoa, here, up here, this is where we get the first case of biological warfare in history, where bodies of Black Death victims, are infected bodies, are thrown over the walls of the city. From, from the, so this is the first moment. I think it's worth like, noting that. Uh, it reminds us as well that it's coming on the ships. So it's coming on, it's coming on a lot of merchant ships. Rats are on the ships. Um, and people don't realize that that's how it's, how it's getting through. Um, and then 1349, it goes up into England. By this point, everyone knows it's coming. Everyone. There's no one in England that doesn't know there's a pandemic in France and that it's coming towards us. People are praying. People are getting into the streets and whipping themselves with, you know, these horrible steel, or what, not steel, um, iron-like claw whips. People are, people are doing penance publicly um, to try and stop it coming. What they're not doing, and they are also doing practical measures, just to be clear. They're also, like, you know, building walls, stopping people coming in. Um, there are a lot of stories about that. Like, you know, in Italy, there are things like, you can't come to our town if you've been in any of these infected towns. That does happen, which is obviously now strikes us as, my goodness, how similar. So a lot of trade has to stop. You know, there is an economic slowdown. <laughs> Actually, it's really bad. It's the worst economic slowdown in history. Um, we're talking about 150 years. It doesn't get back for 150 years. The, the 1400s, I always think, are just, that didn't happen. It's a nothing. It's a horrible to say it. It's not. But in many ways, it is a century of stagnation recovering from this pandemic. Sorry, that's depressing, isn't it? Um, but, um, yeah, people are blocking, but of course they don't realise when they lock the gates to the town that the rats are coming underneath. Uh, they're not aware that it's the rats. It's obviously this small flea on a rat, and within the flea it's a bacillus called Euzerna pestis, small bacillus. Uh, now you just take an antibiotic and it's gone. It's very easy. It's not gone forever, and there was an outbreak in San Francisco in 1900. Um, but it's just not so serious anymore because you can take the antibiotics. I still wouldn't want to get it, but um, it, um, it kills people within three days usually. I think there's something like a 90% mortality rate. So 90% of people who get it will, will die. And everyone got it, basically. So the mortality rate in Europe is 50%. 50% dead. 50. It might be higher. There was a book by Oli Benediktov which said it's higher than that. It's three quarters, even. Uh, I don't know the exact numbers. Um, but uh, the three ways you can die, there's, um, which one would you choose? Uh, there's um, the bubo, the enormous thing that grows under your arm and in your groin, which swells up and then bursts and you die. Uh, there's the pulmonary kind, pulmonary kind, which gets into your lungs, <gasps> lots of phlegm, uh, it's pretty grim, and you die. And then there's my choice, the aneurysm, you just drop dead. Um, you know, suddenly. Uh, but all of this created a lot of confusion because, you know, what is it that's killing people? It's not clear because there are three strains. It sort of makes it even more miraculous. And the fact that people are just dropping dead. At first, of course, there's this huge reaction. Of course, it's God striking us all down, blah, blah, blah. 
And then there's this anti-Semitic outburst. Of course, it's Jewish people punishing us um, for, they're, they're envious of Christianity. But of course, that one kind of stops when they notice that all the Jews are dying too from the Black Death, of course. Um, so look, there's some horrible stuff. And then eventually, we do get the dance of death and a sense of, well, there's no, there is no why. There is no reason. People are just dying. Uh, it's very grim. Okay, um, it then moves on into... Uh, here. There's actually one part of Europe which never gets affected, which is uh, the southern part of Poland. Uh, again, Tomasz is not here. We could celebrate. Um, no one knows why. Some argue that it's just too far. For The nearest town was too far away. Anyone who was infected would die on the journey. Uh, I don't know the answer. I'm going to leave it there. Um, I'm going to open it to questions now. Um, any questions about medieval commerce, capitalism, highest poverty, anything at all, and especially you Zoomers. I'm sorry if I haven't spoken loud enough for you, um, but any questions you might have. Yes. I have a question, actually. Oh, yes. Uh, so how did uh, development of commerce in Europe uh, affect on neighbor, neighboring countries, I mean, neighboring not European countries? Good question. Um, there is a general benefit. Um, and again, Janet Abu Lagood in her Beyond European Hegemony, before European Hegemony, makes that clear. Yeah, there is a knock-on effect. Places like Egypt are becoming extremely wealthy with this, uh, with the commercialization of Europe. Um, I'm not so sure, though. I'm not so sure how, um, how vast and, and important that is. I think what we're seeing is a very weakened part of the trade network joins in. Um, so it's more of a case of Europe becomes less impoverished and less of a case of everyone benefits from European strength or something like that. Any, any, that was Vlad, wasn't it? Thank you, Vlad. Uh, any other questions? We have to leave. Oh, she has to leave. Okay. That's, of course, I understand. Anyone else? Louis, there's a microphone behind you on the chair. Uh, thanks a lot, Pete. So first, two uh, small, uh, purely historical questions, and then maybe a general comment. Uh, first simple question is, in which country or which culture were the first uh, coins uh, invented uh, to pay? Uh, do historians know that? And the second question is, if you would compare, is there a way to compare, let's say, the material wealth uh, between cities on the, on the Silk Road, since we are not far from it, and uh, European cities, let's say in, in, in this 12th, 13th, 14th century. Can one more or less compare the wealth of, of, let's say, the big cities there and come to the conclusion, yes, Europe was, Italy was uh, clearly the richest place on earth uh, at that time? Well, so first of all, Italy was definitely not the richest place on earth at this time. Um, Europe is still small fry in comparison to some of the big Chinese cities or some of the big cities in, um, and even like Constantinople, like I don't think Rome or Venice are as wealthy as Constantinople. Um, that does change, but like 1204. We, we, in the 12th, 13th century, so Constantinople and Chinese cities were richer than, uh, I let's say, so. Florence. I believe, and so. I believe so. I'm not sure how we would yeah, I'm not surprised, it. yeah. I'm not sure how we could, would compare it. Like, but like, somewhere like Alexandria would be a much more significant economic power, like the city in, in Egypt, would be a much more significant economic power than, than any of these Italian cities. And definitely compared with any English or French cities. Like, it's relative at this stage. But I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how we would compare it. We'd have to look. We could, um, no, one's, um, no one that I've read has done the adjustment for population. It's very difficult to do well, that. Well, I think it's itself. not that difficult. You can, for instance, have an estimation of how many goods, let's say cloth, bread, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, grains, and so on, were. were, were okay. Well, okay. okay. Maybe it's not that easy, but. And coins, your first question about coins. So coins are, there are a lot of coins. There are coins in circulation all right, throughout this period, from Roman era onwards. I mean, yeah, the Romans had coins too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we need to talk to our friend Evgeny Grishin, who has a wonderful personal collection, personal collection of uh, coins. Um, it's marvellous. He has a coin from uh, the Athens of Plato and Aristotle in his own personal collection. It's just wonderful. Um, but um, maybe the question is... Um, like. Gold coins, for example, Frederick II in the 13th century is the first to make a gold coin um, in, in this era. So that's like the 1250, uh, what is it, the 1230s or something like that. 
Um, there are coins, it's done on weight, like it's the weight of your coin. So you like have silver coins, you know, like they're not always standardized precisely. Um, it's about the weight. And so you'll have local mints and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Can... It has a long history, right? It's and a it's, long, long yeah, history. Yeah, and it certainly yeah. did not start in Europe. Um, no. So I am just asking these questions to say that, you know, as we are all used to uh, from a history books, we have a very Eurocentric view of, of history, right? And of, for instance, the origin of capitalism. And it's, it's kind of understandable in, in from at least, let's say, the 16th century, Europe was winning big time, and now it's, it's still winning in a sense, if you, and, and well, uh, if you forget for a moment America. But the West is, is from a capitalist point of view, uh, winning, or at least it has uh, until China takes over. But I'm, I'm sure that many people from countries like India, uh, 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 Lebanon, I have a lot of Lebanese friends and in France they are very uh, active and, and they would be rubbing their, their heads when they hear that, you know, uh, Europe would be the cradle of, of capitalism. I mean, they would surely complain and say, well, you know, uh, centuries before yeah, we... Right. we so, and, I, and again, to reiterate, um, that excellent book, um, Before European Hegemony, it makes that point over and over again. Like. Um, we need to put in perspective what Europe is in this period. Like, um, it, just, it just does not have the gravity. It has no gravity, basically. And especially somewhere like England. England is a total backwater. It's a real nothing, I'm afraid to say. Uh, no surprise for you there. It's a total, like, uh, and as I've I mean, said... We, I we, we've all been the, the, the backwaters of someone else at some period, so, you know... Yes, every place has been the backwater. But in this period, if you were saying, where is going to be the... Where will we have an industrial economy... You would put all of your money on Egypt. Um, you'd put quite a lot of your money on Italy, depending. You would put none of your money on the north of England. That would be ridiculous. But weirdly, the north of England is where we get industrialization. So there's a lot of change, obviously, that happens between my period, this period, and in modernity, industrialization. Um, good questions. Are we, any other questions or? Oh, uh, I yes. actually have a question. Yes, Anne. Um, in Russia, we have a tale that uh, Black Death did not affect us so much because uh, there were bathes spread in Russia, while in Europe, people didn't uh, wash themselves uh, very often. Sound possible? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it does sound possible. Um, let me think. Uh, I don't know too much about bathing um, in this period, so I don't know. It also seems kind of, you know, you can have your lovely bath, but then you can be bitten by a flea still. Um, it's true that, you know, you can, it's true that you can um, probably wash off the fleas, but, you know, all it takes is one flea to just quickly nip you and then you're done for. I think there might be a better answer as to why Russia doesn't get it, which is that answer before about it's just so far away. You know, to get to, uh, to Moscow at this point, um, it's a long, long journey. A lot of people who are sick are going to die on their way. So that might be one answer. Um, maybe, I don't know, maybe there's a genetic answer. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> maybe there was something. Well, I think it's a combination of, of all those. And yet drowning the fleas seems to be like a good idea, you know, by b bathing. Okay, so maybe your bathing theory is right, Anne. Okay, any other questions? Yes, yes, I know, sorry. Please. Actually, yes, I, I know it's not true that uh, territory of Russia was not hard by Black Death. As I know, it was hard. Uh, and the cities was uh, affected very much. And as I know, some Moscow knights ruler mm -hmm. uh, was well, and his family were, ha, ha, died whole I mean he and his family died all when this is time of like that okay so the baths weren't enough in the end I, I think yeah uh, but, but, but didn't help actually this is sad it's guys it's a human tragedy it's like one of the great human tragedies um, you know um, you know, it's uh, it, it just it's it's uh, it's unthinkable, really, uh, the amount of devastation it causes. Of course, it does other things. It, it does liberate um, the labour force, 
you know, there are, w when the population is decimated, you still need a lot of agriculture doing, and there's just less labor to do it. Uh, so laborers start to be able to charge more money for the same work. But uh, I still don't think <laughs> it's not worth it. It's not, um, and actually, there's a lot of repression of those uh, laborers who try and change working conditions. There's like a series of laws introduced to stop people from charging more money. Repressive laws. Um, Okay, guys, I, I get the feeling that we're, it's got that kind of end of, end of time feeling. Uh, any other questions? I want to thank you again. Um, I will, Zoomers, I will send um, the PowerPoint slides will be up there and you can have access to the recording of the lecture as well. Um, I think I think we can arrange that um, quite easily. So if there's anything you missed, if I was standing on the other side of the room and you missed me say stuff, hopefully that can be resolved. Um, I look forward to seeing you all in the seminar on Thursday. Guys, I, I, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for showing up so late at night. Um, I really appreciate it. <laughs>